Wherever you are on your leadership voyage, it starts here. Welcome to Leadership Voyage, the fourth episode of the first season of the podcast dedicated to your pursuit of becoming a great leader. My name is Jason Wick, and I'm really happy you've tuned in for this episode with Maria Okerlund. She is a co-author of the sixth edition of Creating Effective Teams. Maria is a licensed psychologist and has spent 25 years working as a consultant in work psychology. In 2005, Maria introduced the Group Development Questionnaire, or the GDQ, in Sweden and participated in the translation and adaptation of the GDQ to Swedish. She has taught around 40 certification courses. Since the 1st of January 2015, Maria has been co-owner and CEO of GDQ Associates AB, which owns the GDQ. Besides her work at GDQ Associates AB, Maria works as a consultant at the company Henriksen Ackerlund AB. Maria is the co-author of the books Teams in the Spotlight and the sixth edition of Susan Whalen's book, Creating Effective Teams, which was published in autumn of 2020. This edition has been revised by Maria along with her colleague, Christian Jacobson. A quick cheat sheet for those of you listening to this conversation with Maria. Susan Whalen is the original researcher and author of Creating Effective Teams. She wrote the first five editions. This most recent edition, the sixth, was co-written by Maria and her colleague Christian Jacobson. The term GDQ is the Group Development Questionnaire, and we'll learn all about that in this discussion. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the learning of this discussion on the fourth episode, first season of Leadership Voyage. Well, Maria, thank you very much for making some time this afternoon, especially considering our time difference. It's nice to meet you this afternoon. You too. And thank you for having me. It looks like you've been doing this work a long time. You've, you're a licensed psychologist, uh, a consultant, a speaker, and of course, an author, the sixth edition of Creating Effective Teams. I'm kind of curious, what inspired you to kind of get into the business of people in the first place? Mm. Um, I have a story around that, and um, I'm going to tell it because it's actually the truth. I am a bit embarrassed that that, that is how I got into this, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you anyway. Sounds good. The, 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 the truth is that I, I, I saw a film that was called Ordinary People. <laughs> I think you you know Robert Redford. Of you course. Know, yeah. That was the first film that he directed. Hmm. And it's about a family uh, that had recently lost a team member, uh, one of two sons, in a boating accident. And the surviving son was in the accident, so he was quite traumatized psychologically. And in the film, he seeks out a psychiatrist, hmm. uh, to, you know, because he, he really needed help. And he tells the psychiatrist that my goal is to be more in control. And the psychiatrist, Judd Hirsch, if you if mm -hmm. you he says, I'm not so hot on control. And that really triggered me. I wanted to be like that psychiatrist. He was so cool. Uh, so then I decided I wanted to be a psychologist. I, I, I wasn't going to be a psychiatrist, but a psychologist. And I thought then that I would work as a psychotherapist, but I never did. I, okay. I ended up working in um, IO psychology, I think it's called in America, industrial organizational psychology. So that's my story. That's the... I, I, you used the word kind of embarrassed, but I think that's a, a beautiful story. I mean, in some cases, you know, people create art, movies, music, whatever to inspire things. And yeah, here's someone in mm. your case talking about it did just that for you. Uh, yeah. How, what age, if you don't mind me asking, like what age, what, what phase of your life were you in when you saw this film? Mid twenties. Okay. Wow. I was all, I was already at the university studying, you know, this and that. So like first creative Swedish and then English. And I, I um, applied to study uh, law, but I, you know, thought that was, seemed really boring. So, <laughs> and I watched this, I saw the film and then 
I decided. <laughs> Helped you with the epiphany. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're, we got together today because um, I was interested in talking to you about this sixth edition of Creating Effective Teams. It's good to know where you're coming from with your initial inspirations for, for your work. Uh, if you don't mind going into a little bit of detail, how have you come to uh, be involved in the book? Well, that's because I had something to do with uh, Susan Whelan's fame in Sweden because she she is quite famous in this you know this little country here um and also the fact that the book creating effective teams was translated to Swedish many years ago now and that a lot of people in this country have bought and read that book through the years I contacted Susan in 2004 I think after uh, an American uh, an American psychologist also called Susan actually uh, had told me that I should look at what Susan Whelan had written, her, her, her work, her research, because she had done research on team development. Because we we worked as consultants with team development, we, but we weren't really sure if that was, you know, empirically supported. Um, sure. So, so when, when I heard about Susan, I immediately tried to contact her. And she immediately then asked me, back like do you want a swedish translation of the gdq mm -hmm. and i said yes and i had no idea what that was i didn't know what the gdq was but <laughs> oh, yes we want that uh and that was you know that was the beginning we then invited her the company where i worked at that time invited her to sweden mm -hmm. and she certified the consultants uh at me and my colleagues at that company at that time and after I was certified, I was allowed to do the translation. Uh, so, but translating is the easy bit. So, we, you know, you have to adjust uh, a test in different ways to a new language. So um, I persuaded a, a journalist that I uh, happened to meet in another context to write about Susan, to interview Susan when she was in Sweden. And uh, that that interview was published. And then a guy in Gothenburg, who is a researcher in Gothenburg, read that article. And he was about to do a big project with teams, and he wanted this kind of a, you know, a, a tool or, or test. So um, he contacted Susan too, and Susan brought the two of us together. And that uh, after that, we have collaborated all these years, Christian and I. So we are we are now the owners of the of GDQ Associates. So we, when Susan retired, she sold um, the intellectual properties to, to uh, Christian and me. They wanted then to make the sixth edition. Susan had passed away, and Susan's partner uh, suggested that we could perhaps do uh, a good job with the, the sixth edition. So that's how it all happened. Well, thanks for the story there and and when you when you talk about gdq you're talking about the uh, group development questionnaire right mm -hmm. and so you've been working on that in sweden for about sounds like 17 years or so at this point mm -hmm. certifying people for for the listeners could you go into a little more detail about the group development questionnaire and why um it's an important uh tool or activity for for a team uh so it is a questionnaire as i found out and it consists of 60 statements about group processes and states that members then rate from one to five based on to which degree they think the statements are a description of their team at that particular point in time. And these 60 statements are divided into four scales. So there are four scales uh, in the GDQ, 15 items in each. And each of those scales represent a stage in the development of teamwork that all teams go through. So the idea behind the GDQ is that teams move through uh, four different developmental stages and that, and that each stage they need to sort of solve team development problems, so to speak, and, and acquire a, a team competence. Just to go through the four stages, the, the four stages are first dependence and inclusion, so that's what sort of um, typical of that phase is that people uh, feel are leader dependent and they are looking to feel included. So they're asking themselves, am I being, uh, am I welcome here, so to speak? 
After that, there's a stage called counterdependence and fight. And the problem to solve there is to taking back some of the authority that, you, that the members have put on the leader. So go from leader dependence to owning their own authority. And also um, integrating differences between among members. And if they do that, if they uh, manage to take back some of the authority and also integrate some differences, solve some uh, conflict, they will get into a stage called trust and structure. And that already sounds quite good because they have <laughs> talking about their differences and being and solving conflicts that would then lead to trust. There is no other way to get to trust. You can't get to trust by being polite, you know, and um, it would strike me that's that's perhaps the biggest the biggest mountain to climb for most teams. It is. That's the really big um, threshold, so to speak, mm. to get get over that. Um, when teams are in stage one, they're not very effective, so they have a, a low effectiveness, and then it gets worse in, <laughs> in uh, counterdependence and fight. And after that, it gets better. Mm. So you need to make that investment, so to speak, to get something back later. Uh, so trust and structure, um, it has both a relational uh, aspect of it, which is trust, and also structure is more about, you know, task, the task work. And then if they keep uh, working on that, both trust and structure, they will get into work and productivity, which is the most effective stage in a group's life, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and based on the scores of these four, on these four scales, it is possible then to establish which stage the team is in at a specific point in time. And the GDQ also gives information about which processes, states or competencies the team should focus their efforts on developing at that point in time to become a more mature team. So it isn't only, you know, uh, the information that you are in stage this or that, but you get more information about what to do. As I was reading through this book a couple of weeks ago, which, by the way, I already was, you know, um, without putting my own team at work through the the paces of the questionnaire, was already assessing where where I thought things were, thinking it through, which was really a good exercise. I've already taken some actions around clarifying uh, roles with certain people on my team where I thought there was confusion, you know, and 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 so so thank you for that. First of all, um, the real application is great. When you talk about what it takes for a team to to be productive, there are many different elements, such as roles goals, uh, leadership, structure, conflict management, and I think there are 10 of these. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, when it talks about certain keys to a team's productivity, from your experience, do you have any favorite that you like looking for, talking about, helping with, any anything like that? I do. I, um, goals is my favorite. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Uh, because... Goals is the reason a team exists. Mm. There are, and there are so many different kinds of goals also. So there are external goals, uh, which are, you know, the goals that tell the team what they are supposed to deliver to external stakeholders like clients or management or stuff like that. So that is usually when it comes to teams in, in work life, and that's the reason that, that a team exists, to deliver something to external stakeholders. But there are also internal goals, uh, which are to do with the development that I just talked about. Mm -hmm. So there's, all, there's also this potential in all teams, um, the possibility to go from stage one to stage four. So that is an implicit goal that, that can also be explicit, that, you know, it's, it's there implicitly, perhaps in many teams that they don't talk about it, they, they don't know it, that they can, and they don't think about it. But it can also be spelled out that you can, you can talk about it and decide that we want to develop our internal team processes. I love this topic, and I'm really, actually, I'm really excited you chose goals and have framed it the way that you have. Something that stood out to me about, <clears throat> about the book and the progression through the four phases was a specific element about debriefing 
or mm -hmm. sometimes um, uh, for, for me, I work in software development. Uh, we refer, we call it at, uh, retrospectives. Yeah. Now you talked about the formation of a team. The impetus for a team's existence is, is likely an external need, delivering something to a stakeholders, whatever it is, right? That's why we're spinning up this team in the first place. But now we talk about like the cultural norms of a team, the behaviors of a team. And something that the book says is a team that regularly debriefs or retrospects is, is about 25% more effective than those that don't. Yeah. Now that really stood out to me because what I'm going to go ahead and guess is a lot of teams out there say, we're too busy to look back. We have too much to do to stop and think about what we're doing. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions around setting that culture up? And in addition, any more insights on that performance improvement, that 25% more effective for a team that does debrief or retrospect? Well, actually, it's it's even more than 25 because there's been research after that. Um, okay. the, the, the most recent meta-analysis shows that it's 30% at least. Okay. So it's a lot. This is huge, actually. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> you yeah. could think of it as adding, you could, I mean, I don't know if this works um, mathematically, but you could say if I had a 10 person team, I'm getting, you know, 13 people's worth of work out of them or something yeah. like this, right? It's true. Uh, and also there's there's research before, you know, there's research on debrief. So debrief is a method, you could say, or an intervention, and, and they've done research on that. But even before that, Researchers have sort of observed teams and found that if a team is, you know, allowed to to work autonomously without anyone interfering with it, they do show that kind of a pattern that they move between phases of action hmm. uh, when they are in the here and now um, and focused on the external world. Uh, on the one hand, so so action phases uh, they they actually call that on the one hand, and phases of transition, as they call it, when they sort of um, slow down and become more introverted, introspective, yeah. uh, and they uh, look back in time at how did we work, how, how, how did our team processes work, and then they look ahead to see how do we want to work, uh, you know, in the next action phase, so to speak. So there is um, already, even if we don't decide that we are going to use a method called debrief, there is that tendency. And the reason why this works is you can learn from the past in order to self-regulate. Mm. So you draw conclusions about how the team processes were functioning, you know, when we work together. And then we can decide how we want to correct, to self-correct or to regulate that behavior in the future. Uh, and I think the, the, the thing that you talked about, that groups say that they don't want to do it because they don't really have time. Mm -hmm. And I, I was doing a, a, manage, a, um, a leadership training with a group of managers uh, recently, and I overheard one of the leaders, she didn't know I was listening or, I, you know, that I was there. She said, I don't want to reflect. I want to work. <laughs> uh, I think that's, you know, common. And I also think that it's, um, that's one reason that they really, and, and it could be a real reason if, you know, if an organization is pushing the teams too much yeah. to constantly be, you know, performing, they may not really have time to stop and reflect. To do this is also um, something that you do that can can also feel intimate. Mm. That you together we are reflecting on how we're doing, and there is also oh, you know a risk that I might get some feedback now that I don't mm. really want. And so it it uh, it's asking a lot of the members that they want to do this to be honest and and close to each other to do this. And I think that's the reason why some groups avoid it. It's it's hard to do it in stage one, but if you do it, you will move away from stage one and be, become more developed, so to speak. And it will uh, accelerate development. I uh, I appreciate 
the anecdote, I don't want to reflect, I want to work, I, I like that. Uh, and I appreciate the explanation of not wanting to do something, but it's it pays off later yeah. on. I could imagine some people might be thinking, okay, you said 25, 30% more productivity, like, you know, get real. How can I, how can you really prove this, right? Now, one thing that I really appreciate about the, so in this sixth edition, we have chapters 11 and 12, two new chapters in the book. And the 12th chapter is something that I really appreciate in my own words. It's an audit <laughs> of the group development questionnaire in practice yeah. from, from looking at the way that it's been applied and used in over these previous years. Yeah. And, and I love how, you know, basically you put your own practice to the test and are, you know, of course, very proud and happy to, to, uh, to relay the idea that what you have described in the first 10 chapters of the book is in general how teams do work and how things play out. I, I really want to say that most of the research was done by Susan Whelan, so she, sure. you know, and, and the writing. So um, I just think this is not, this is most of my colleague who is a researcher, I'm not a researcher, I'm a, a practitioner. Susan was, um, uh, a parenthesis, uh, Susan was um, a teacher, a practitioner and a researcher and, a, you know, a writer. So she was everything, really. Um, and I always thought uh, that she made the GDQ to do research, but uh, I found out when I reread um, some of her writings that she really created the GDQ for, you know, to, to give to groups so that they could use it to develop. So she was very much also a uh, practitioner. So I think that this chapter is just, you know, goes through all the different studies, basically, perhaps not all of her studies, but the most important studies that she made. And then um, some of the studies that Christian has done in Sweden, um, and also some, perhaps also some other studies. Um, researchers nowadays, they talk about, they have definitions, you know, uh, for a team, what is a team? Yeah. And also, they, they also think that all teams have three goals and those are uh, delivering something like i said earlier to external stakeholders uh, being a good work environment for it for its members and thirdly to develop hmm. and susan's research was all about the, the the delivery to external stakeholders so what she did was to explore the correlation between the stage and the delivery of, you know, um, different services or products to external stakeholders. Like she, she did, uh, is there a, a correlation between a, um, a teacher team's results on the GDQ and their students' results on um, state exams? Okay. So, and, and she could see that uh, if the teacher team was more developed, the students did better. At these exams, and also teams in healthcare, they have uh, uh, lower mortality rates if they are more mature. If the teams are more mature compared to less matured. Yeah, that's that's great, and thank you for clarifying uh, some of the roles and details there as well about yeah. the book and the research. I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to add that Christian did he concern himself with the second goal. So he's been looking at the correlation between uh, team development and the, the team as work environment. Okay. And he could see correlations between, you know, the more mature the team was, the more um, psychologically healthy the team environment was. The, the, the other new chapter is um, about, yeah. uh, let's see, what was the subtitle exactly? Um, Changing changes in team functioning changes in team functioning and if i if i recall um we're talking about uh multicultural teams is that how we it was referred to in the book yeah um and and that's one of one of the new chapters it inspired me to to think about okay well i'm i'm going to be talking with someone in sweden i i should probably spend a few minutes to look up what some of the uh 
the business customs in Sweden are. So I made sure I was on time. And I noticed you were before me even. So that, <laughs> you, <laughs> um, things like this, you know, is interesting. Now, most of us have heard of emotional intelligence, social intelligence. This chapter talks about cultural intelligence and the mm-hmm. encouragement that businesses should help develop their leaders and team members' cultural intelligence. Could you talk a little bit about cultural intelligence for us? Um, I'm not sure I can, because I I think it's a a very complicated issue. I don't know that we know a a lot about it, actually. And I think I used to go to America for for the SIOP conference. Um, We don't go anymore. We do it digitally, you know, Mm -hmm. since 2020. Um, and SIOP is the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychologists. So you can hear the, uh, the, you know, the latest research on teams and leadership and personality and everything like that. Uh, and there were researchers that were talking about it there. And uh, so they, they talked about how cultural research uh, or, or, and also you know, culture in the workplace. So research on that has been going on for many years. So there's lots and lots of that there. And then you have team research over here, but they haven't really been integrated. So okay. it's quite a new uh, area of um, uh, of research. And usually, when when you talk about it, the, the research that you can find in this area, they talk about cultural variables like power distance, uh, high and low, you know. Um, yeah. And also about uh, collectiveness versus individualistic uh, Mm -hmm. culture. Uh, And there are a lot of differences and it isn't um, necessarily easy because if you look at team research, it's, it's everything that I talked about, that you have this idea of you go from stage one to stage four. And, uh, you know, uh, in stage two, you take back, members take back the authority. Some members will then join in leadership of the team. And, you know, so so, uh, a very clear goal in Western culture is to have shared leadership Mm -hmm. so that members also take responsibility, not only for their bit, but for the whole team. And and that is not necessarily so easy in, in some uh, cultures where you have a high power distance. So if a leader acts uh, in accordance with that idea that you then delegate leadership and you involve members in in the leadership, uh, a leader may then be seen as weak mm. and vague. Yeah. Uh, and that will create problems. And I don't know, that, I mean, cultural intelligence would be to to understand this and to know about it. But I don't see that we have an easy solution to that. <laughs> so so uh, the, the, uh, we know that shared leadership correlates with effectiveness. Yeah. And we also know that if we try to uh, achieve shared leadership, we might also run into problems if we have a culturally mixed group. So, so I think there is a lot more to learn in this area. And, and, and also there is this risk that we oversimplify that's one thing I was curious about as well, is you have kind of cultural norms and stereotypes and which of them yeah. are helpful and which aren't. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. Yeah. So so we're kind of at the place now where we have studies uh, on different streams, but we haven't necessarily combined the two. Being aware of it is helpful, but we don't really know uh, at scale or through a meta-analysis at this point, anything particularly insightful yet. That's kind of where we're at. I think that, it, yeah, and, and to, just to say something about the, there is cultural intelligence that we, we need. And that, and I think we know that we become more culturally intelligent if we um, move, live in other countries. And, you sure, know, yeah. So, so it's, uh, that's an answer so that, you know, you, you get exposed to these differences. I mean, it, the, the whole idea is we have cultural differences, but it's the same as any kind of difference that like we don't really like difference. That's, you know, the, the human condition that we react to difference. So it's a, a constant um, work that we need to do to sort of gradually uh, open up to and integrate tolerable differences uh, more and more. 
to make it easier for the team to integrate differences, I think that if you really think about doing a good job as early as you can, clarifying the goals and the roles, it will be much easier to then sort of, because uh, cultural differences, I would say, um, belong in the category um, deep level differences. So researchers sure. talk about surface level and deep level differences. Okay. And it and it I think it's a very good thing if you have done a good job of clarifying the goals and some structures and the roles, because that will help us to explore and integrate differences within a structure and within, you know, to have something to hold on to. And also the goals will give us criteria for yeah, what is, what is uh, desirable and not, so that we don't just, uh, if we don't have that, we don't have, if we don't have criteria that are linked to the goals that we have as a team, everything becomes personal. Okay. And it's whether I like it or not. So that's what we right. need to, you know, to separate out. So it's so better than to have uh, agreed upon goals that we can link back to. Yeah, thank you for emphasizing those that focus on goals and structure and roles and how that framework could help with the integration of differences and um, and also that distinction between deep and surface level. I think that is a, a good thing to be aware of without a doubt. As we uh, start to wrap up our conversation here, of which I have learned a ton and I already read the book, so I, I would encourage anyone out there to, to check out the sixth edition of Creating Effective Teams. Where could... Uh, where could folks learn more about you and your services if they have interest uh, in that? Well, I'm, I'm just going to say that the book is on Amazon, the, this book, Creating Effective Teams. Uh, if you want to know more about the GDQ Associates, it's gdq.se. You can learn more about our services, um, about Susan Whelan and all her work. We have references to all her research and there's lots more interesting uh also about the, the certification and everything yeah so much so many different areas of depth to dive into in all of these areas i i just have to say 15 pages of of sources which i'm sure came largely from susan uh back in the mm -hmm. day but wow just robust uh a robust set of of research thank you gdq.se for those interested the book is on amazon I want to finish out with the question I ask everyone. Doesn't have to be related to what we're talking about. What is something that you have learned recently, Maria? I was going to prepare that and I forgot. Well, now it that will be I... really recent. <laughs> yes. Um, I Okay. So it's going to be something completely not related to what we've been talking about. Um, I'm trying to... Uh, create a life again after having worked extremely, you know, uh, much uh, and not really having any free time. So I'm, I'm trying to, so I'm, I'm trying to, to do different things. And I've gone back to knitting, which I used to do when I was young. And I've discovered that knitting is something else today. These days, it's much more advanced and complicated. So I'm learning every day new techniques oh. in my knitting. Uh, so that's something. And also, I'm. I'm trying to, um, what do you call that? Plants and vegetables and um, cultivating. Oh, gardening. Gardening, gardening yeah. is the one. Yeah. yeah. So right. I'm, I'm, I'm learning that I don't know anything about it yet. So <laughs> but I'm trying, yeah. Well, good. Well, thanks for sharing those. Really appreciate that. <laughs> well, have a, good, uh, have a good rest of your day. And thank you so much for the time today. Really appreciate it. And I know that everybody will have gotten a lot of uh, useful information out of this discussion. So thank you so thank much. You so much. Thank you for having me. Wherever you are on your leadership voyage, it starts here.